Amen. Amen. All right. So tonight's sermon will be the finality of the study through the book of Romans, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Romans chapter number 16. Now, I made a couple of points, which will, I will touch on here in the introduction this week. I made a couple of points last week about this particular chapter. One of them being that this is the longest list of salutations in the entire Bible. And what's very interesting about that is that in this list of salutations, he's not vague. He doesn't just list families. He lists specific people by their name, by their own name. And you can see elsewhere that he actually, in I believe it's uh, one of John's epistles, he actually talks about you know saluting the brethren by name or saluting the friends by name. So that is a commandment that we should know people's names. We live in a, uh, you know, or not live, but we attend... A small church, there's no excuse for not knowing people's names, but even when the church grows, a point that I want to make, we still need to know everyone that attends the church, we still need to make it a point, sit down if you have to, memorize people's names, it means something to that person when you know their name and you see them every week and you say, hey, Brother Russell, Brother Hall, that means something to someone, especially a visitor too. When visitors come in here, make it a point, hey, I'm going to catch your name, especially you know, you should do it anyways, but especially if you're like, I think that guy's coming back. Make sure you know his name, and the next time he comes in the door, next time she comes in the door, next time they come in the door, remember their names. That could be a big point that actually pulls them back in. A big factor, like, hey, they seem really friendly. They really cared about us, that other church that we went to, that other church that we attended, they could never get our names right. We went there, everybody remembered our names, everybody was friendly, they greeted us. That makes a difference. There's a reason why God, all of God's laws, all of God's you know, commandments or statutes, whatever you want to call them, they're all practical. And when you see in the Bible, as I mentioned in John's epistles, he mentions the fact that you should salute the brethren by name. There's a reason for that. It shows that you care. And just by sitting down, if you don't care, if you're forced to sit down and memorize that person's name, you're going to start to care. So that's important to you. But you see a list here of salutations. The longest list in the Bible, this is actually a church that Paul had never been to. So he had never even seen these people face to face, but he already, just from hearing about them, just from speaking to people, just from word of mouth, he's able to say, hey, salute this person, salute that one. That's impressive. You know, that's very impressive. It's, you know what? Imagine if you were one of the people that Paul like mentioned, mentioned the name. You had never talked to Paul, but he mentioned your name. Don't you think you would feel special? That's how people would feel coming in here. You remember their name. You're like, hey. You know, so-and-so, hey, Joe, whatever it may be. That's the most common name, I guess, Joe. So whatever it may be, right? But they, that's important to people. It means something to people. So we see the, list, the, the long list of salutations, but it starts off in Romans chapter number 16, verse number 1, where he says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. Now, what is a full definition of the word commend? Because a, a minimal definition, a, you know, a very simplistic definition is, is you know, uh, to, if you will, show. That's what we'll always say in Romans chapter number 5, which that is a partial definition. It is to show something. But a full definition is to prove. That's really what, some, what it means to commend something. Like, I've already tried this, and I'm positive about it. Like, I know that this works. I commend you, you know, this person because they're a good person. I've tried this person. I've known this person for years. I'm going to commend them to you, right? Everyone understand what I mean by that? By proving. So he says here, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. So Paul personally knew Phoebe, and he could, you know, give his opinion. He could give a good opinion about her, right? He commended her under her, so he knew her, obviously, well. He says, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. So we see, we see that he refers to her as a servant. So she is a worker, and that's what we all are at the church. We're servants. Right. Our job and the job of the church is to work. It's not a social club. Our job is to work. That's yeah. why we're here, to do work, to get things done. Yeah. Not just to meet and, and to speak. Of course, we love the fellowship, but we need to serve. We need to be servants. So he says, as a servant of the church, which is at Centria, then he says, verse 2, verse two so he commended, and then he says, that ye receive her in the Lord. So he's, I'm commending her, and he's saying, I want you to receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. So what you can see by putting verses 1 and 2 together is that Phoebe is actually, she's, she's the, she, I would say, is the primary person, if not the only person, that's bringing this letter. 
Because he's, when, they, when they receive the letter, he's saying, I commend unto you, Phoebe. He says, Phoebe, our sister. His sister, their sister, right? You know, their brothers and sisters in the Lord. So he's saying that you receive her in the Lord. And then he says, notice that next phrase, too. You can preach a full sermon, sermon on that, as become its saints. Now, what does it mean to you know, become saints? Like, it means a certain way that you should act, right? There's a certain way that you should behave. There's a certain way that you should think. There's a certain way that you should act as a Christian. You have specific standards, standards that should be higher than the world. That's why he says, don't just do it you know, in this way. Don't just do it how the world does it. You know, you need to receive her as becoming saints. How a saint should do it, right? You should have higher standards for us, people of God, right? We represent the, the most high. He says, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of. So you can see immediately the servant is doing work, right? Whatever business. Assist her, he's saying, you work with her and assist her in whatever business she hath need of. A lot of people will act strange about women going soul winning, about women doing work and doing things like that. That's not biblical. Paul actually used Phoebe to deliver this letter. She, and even if there are other people with, with Phoebe, she's the primary one that's mentioned, and he commends her, right? Because she was a great servant of the Lord, obviously. In, I believe, uh, Philippians chapter number 4, Paul talks about the women that labored with him in the gospel. So we see women are to preach the gospel. On the day of Pentecost, when many people were getting saved and God poured out his spirit, it wasn't just on the men, it was on the maidens. It was on the maids. It was on the men and women. They were both preaching the gospel. Men and women are both supposed to labor in the gospel and preach the gospel. Amen. People have bizarre views about, you know, because a woman can't, they, they conflict, you know, and they, and they have this, like, really simple understanding of how the Bible, and like, just the other day, those black Hebrew Israelites, that just popped into my mind. You know, uh, Mrs. Bops was preaching the gospel, and this retard over across the street, that's probably, a, don't say anything about that, that's probably a kinder term than this idiot reserve. Yeah. Right. This guy just keeps yelling across the street, and he's like quoting every scripture that he quotes. He's quoting it wrong, and he quotes the verse about a woman's not to usurp authority over a man. A woman's not to usurp authority. It's like, dude, you don't know the Bible. Just shut up. Yeah. That's what people do. They take these verses that they don't understand, and they don't know the Bible, and I better get back to the text because we could rant on that for a while. But seriously, people can go way too far in one direction. You know, they can go way, they can take a verse and just take it way too far. We see clearly that women are not to pastor churches. This is the clear teaching. Right, right. But that doesn't conclude, well, then they should never just preach the Bible. Or they should never preach to their children. It's like, where do you draw that line? You see how that can get real weird? No, the only, the only command is that a woman is not to preach behind a pulpit. A woman is not to preach. This is exactly what it, how it's, how it's uh, spoken of in the context of to the congregation. Women are not to preach to the congregation. But you see women preaching the gospel. You see women you know, preaching to their children. So, you know, don't fall into these weird views that people will have where, you know, they just like take a, a scripture just way too far. We need to have a balance and understand, compare scripture with scripture, not just isolate a verse. Right? And don't get your doctrine for black Hebrew Israelites, by the way. <laughs> Look at verse number three. So he says, uh, well, there, there at the end, let's finish up verse number two. So he says that he assists her in whatsoever business she hath need of. So there, the, the very last statement at the end, it says, for she hath been a succor of many. Now, a succor or a succor means to be a helper. That's what that means. So she helped them. A helper of many. And he says, and of myself also. So she also assisted Paul as well. Verse number three, what just happened? Was that over there? It's all the power blend. Oh, did it? Oh, everything, huh? Look at verse number three. Uh, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Now turn over to Acts chapter number 18. We're going to look at the very first mention of uh, Aquila and Priscilla. They're actually talked about quite a bit. And uh, here's their first mention in Acts chapter number 18. They're mentioned a few times in this specific chapter. But if you look at chapter number 18, verse number 1, the Bible says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila. So Aquila, we can see, is a Jew born in Pontus, lately come from Italy. So lately there means recently. Lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius 
had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. Now, of course, Rome is located in the nation of Italy. So he, he was the Claudius commanded all Jews to leave. So she had just re or he and his wife, of course, Aquila and Priscilla had just left Rome recently because he kicked all the Jews out. It says, and came unto them. Verse 3, and because he was of the same craft, now that's just like a trade or an occupation. Because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. That means worked. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. So that's referring to, so Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul, they were tent makers. Now, right here, look at verse number 4. It says, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, skip down to verse number, they're mentioned again. Verse number uh, 18, I believe it is, yeah. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, it says, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria. Now watch this. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. And then it gives you this little uh, tidbit of information. Having shorn, I mean, shaved his head in Centria, for he had a vow. Now notice, after he meet, meets Aquila and Priscilla, they stay with him. So you can see that they stick with him, at least for a period of time, at least on a couple of journeys, traveling around. What was Paul doing? Preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. So we can see that they assisted them as well. There's an example, actually, when we looked them up, of them going with Paul and assisting Paul and helping Paul. But look what else it says about them. So it says they're helpers of him. They helped him in Christ Jesus and preaching the gospel. But verse number four, it says this, who, at, who have, referring to Priscilla and Aquila, who have for my life laid down their own necks. So they were willing, they were such devout followers of Paul that they were willing to die for Paul. Now, here's the thing. They were following Paul because Paul followed Christ. Amen. So they were willing, it says right here, to die for Paul. And why? Because Paul was doing such a great work for God. You know, if Paul wasn't doing anything for God, I'm sure that they wouldn't have been willing to, you know, lay down their lives for Paul. Right? And it's not like, oh, I'm just dying for Paul because Paul is such a great guy. I'm sure it's because, you know, number one, he's their brother in Christ, right? And we're supposed to be willing to be able to sacrifice ourselves for our brothers in Christ just as Christ was willing to do for us, right? That's the greatest love, Christ said. But also, think about this. Paul is, I mean, when you look at who got the gospel out, there's no question it was the apostle Paul. And if they are willing, if they're able to step in and, and they're able to, you know, cause that great work to continue by sacrificing themselves, that would be a wise decision and a selfless decision on their part to be able to make sure that Paul is able, who is a great apostle, greatest Christian probably that ever lived, was able to continue. So it could have been a situation like that. Look at verse number, um, let's finish verse 4 there. It says, Unto whom, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So not only did they obviously do great things or help Paul, they're also helping the other, they're also helping all the other churches of the Gentiles. Verse number five, likewise greet the church that is in their house. So they have, and I don't remember this other, um, does anybody remember right off the top of their hand, I didn't look this up, where Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned another time and there's a church in their house. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. But there's another time where this takes place. You can reference that later, where Priscilla and Aquila are talked about, and, and I, I believe it's in another uh, salutation. And he brings them up, and he says, the church in their house. I think it's in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians in the salutations. Somebody finds it, we'll turn there real quick, just for, you know, that's beneficial to know who these people are. Um, yeah. What is it? At the end? It's going to be 16 then, it's the last chapter. 1 Corinthians 16. Yeah, verse 19 says, the churches of Asia salute you. And then he says, Aquila and Pr Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. And then he says, with the church that is in their house. That's the reason why I mention that, because that, that phrase that I remember that is because that phrase is used only like three or four times in the Bible. It's used here in 1 Corinthians. Uh, you know, uh, it's used in one of the later Philemon. It's used in the book of Philemon and then also there in Romans chapter number 16. Where someone, when they start a church in the very beginning, where if they're in an area, maybe where there's not, you know, um, a, not a plentiful amount of people to get a building or something, they will just have a church in their house for a period of time. You can see that Priscilla and Aquila were willing to do that. They were willing to have, you know, the church in their house, to the congregation in their house. Keep looking there. We're, we are in, um, 
Yes, so he says, verse 5, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Juniah, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners. So you can see here that he had already had went, had, he had went to jail at least at one point. I can't remember in the book of Acts particularly what he could be referring to. But before this, he was definitely arrested at least one time by the Jews. So maybe that was that particular time it could be referring to. So he says, who were of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Now, right there when he says, who are of note among the apostles, you know, it could be saying that in, in two different ways. Number one, it, say, it could be saying they're of note, like among the apostles, as in they are apostles. Like among all the apostles, these are great apostles, which is probably not what it's saying. It's probably saying the apostles even respect these guys who are of note among the apostles. They probably labored with the apostles because people have this weird idea that there's only 12, 12 apostles. I don't know what this is. Seven? Twelve <laughs> apostles, right? That's, that's reversed to you guys too. But there's only 12 apostles. That's not correct. There, you know, he, he, you know, after he ordained the 12 apostles, or 12 disciples, if you will, after that, it says that he ordained or appointed 70 others also. So that's not correct. And you can also see, I, I believe Barnabas is referred to as an apostle in one of the epistles as well. So there's, there's multiple other apostles. There's many people that were apostles. And we can see here it says that these, that these people here, Andronicus and Janiah, they are of note among the apostles. So like I said, you can interpret that in two ways. You know, it could be that they're a great apostle and they're of note among the apostles. Like, they're someone of note. Note is like notice. Like, you know, it, they catch your eye. They're not just the usual apostle. These are great men that are apostles. Or, and this is also, either way, this is a great, you know, uh, commendation that's being given here. Either way, the other uh, way you can interpret that is that the apostles... They're of note among the apostles, as in the apostles take note of these guys. Now, that's still, that's still pretty impressive, where the apostles would say, man, these are some great guys. Amen. You know, either way, these are great guys. Either way. So it says in um, you know, the end there, verse number 8. Well, let me point this out. The end of verse number 7, notice what he said also, who also were in Christ before me. So what does he mean by that? This is interesting because this has to do with salvation, right? You know, it, he, he makes the statement who were in Christ before me, right? People that believe that salvation is a process, verses like this make no sense. Because there's not, when's really the time in your process when you get in Christ? You know what I'm saying? He's referring to his, to his personal salvation. He's saying these people were saved before me. They were in Christ before I was because when he got converted, every, you know, when he's on the, uh, the, the road to Damascus, right? He's converted uh, shortly thereafter. And he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's put in Christ. Well, these people were saved before him. So you can see that salvation is not a process. According to simple verses like this, that people are put in Christ, and he, you know, and, and let's say they lost their salvation like some Pentecostals would teach. How would this make sense? They were in Christ, and they got back in Christ later. It doesn't make sense. These people were in Christ before him, and they're still in Christ now. That's the plain reading of the text. Keep reading there, verse number uh, 8. Greet Amplius, my, my beloved, in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of narcissists. I didn't know Stephen Anderson was mentioned in the Bible. Uh, <laughs> and Rick and I were actually just talking about this last week of who narcissists, not Stephen Anderson being a narcissist. I mean, that's, you know, but uh, do, you, do you guys know who, uh, where that came from? Just an interesting fact of narcissists. Do you guys know where that came from? I was telling Brother Rick about this last week. Narcissist was actually a Greek god. This just shows you how, what a joke all these other religions are. And our word narcissist, like a person that is infatuated with himself or self-obsessed, self-centered, whatever you would like to refer to it as, our, our word narcissist comes from this word and actually derives from the name of the Greek god, narcissist. And the reason why he's called, and the reason why that, that came from this is because I thought that it was a mirror, so I got one of the facts wrong, but he actually fell in love with his reflection in the water. And then 
from there derived our term narcissist. And the guy just like sat there. He's a god. I guess he never has to eat or drink. And like stared at his own reflection. That's how some other god defeated him. You know, the point of that was really nothing besides, I guess you could take away is that these, the Greek mythology is a joke. You know, anybody who thinks, oh, there's all these religions in the world, come on. You know, there's one true God. The Bible is, is the only true religion. All the, all the, you look into all these other religions, they're all like that. They're all ridiculous and they're all a joke. That's where our word narcissist comes from, if you were wondering about that. So it says, um, in, uh, it says, which are in the Lord. He says, salute, verse 12, salute Tryphena and Tryphosa who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis which labored much in the Lord. Now, if you'd notice, I don't know if you, you know, uh, maybe you have it because you're not familiar with different languages you know, very well. But all of these names that are very different of the Old Testament. If you read your Bible not a lot, you'd notice this whole list is very different than, than, than reading the names in the Old Testament. Because these are all Gentiles. These are all Greek names. They're heavily Greek names, which makes perfect sense because they are in the capital, right? They're in Rome, right? So that makes perfect sense. While everybody's narcissist and named after, you know, uh, you know Greek gods and things like that. So uh, keep reading there. Verse number 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother in mine. I always thought that that was a strange statement. Now, I don't, I don't know, you know, exactly what this means. Maybe, maybe, you know, where he makes the statement and his mother and mine. I mean, maybe, I guess you could say that it could be that this is like his, his you know, brother, possibly. Or it could be maybe he's just referring to, to, to her as his mother, just kind of in an, using an endearing term. You know, how the, how the Bible will, uh, you know, teaches, it, you know, the idea of ethics in, uh, what is it, 2 Timothy, where he goes through 2 Timothy chapter number 5, I believe, where he goes through how to treat the elder women, you know, and, and you know, treat them like mothers. He talks about treating the elder men like fathers. Maybe that could be, and, and Paul's actually the one writing that, so that would make sense. So he could be just speaking, he may have, he may have came and maybe stayed, you know, met Rufus elsewhere and met his mother, something along those lines. It, it seems as if he knows this person more personally than he does everybody else. He obviously, had, I believe, has met this person somewhere. Like Priscilla and Aquila, you know, he's telling, you know, those at the Church of Rome to greet Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila are obviously there in Rome, and Paul has met them, you know, at some point in the past, but they're not with him any longer. So he could have met Rufus and his mother, you know, in the past and treated her as though it was his mother and, and you know, carried out you know, uh, what he had taught in 2 Timothy. You, everyone understand what I'm saying? Could have been just treating her as his mother, or you never know, man. It could be his actual mom. I have no idea. Just keep reading there, verse number 14. Salute Ancyprithus, Phlegon, or Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philo, Philologus and Julia, Nereus, and his sister Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with a an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Verse number 17, he says, now I, you know, we start getting into a little bit of meat here, at least uh, you know, something we can take from doctrinally. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division, divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Now, this particular statement, I do not believe that this is just a statement that's talking about a saved person that's teaching false doctrine. And the reason why is the verse that he follows it up with does not seem to me to speak of just a normal saved guy who's just teaching a false doctrine. He says in verse number 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, Deceive the hearts of the simple. Now that to me, you know, does not sound like a person that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and is just kind of went wayward. That sounds to me like a person like the Bible talks about in Jude and in 2 Peter chapter number 2, where it's someone that is like, you know, by reason of whom the truth shall be evil spoken of. And why? Because of for lasciviousness and for money they are in it for Christ. And that's what this sounds like. They're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're serving their own belly, and that's referring to their own lusts. They're using the office of a bishop, and there are people like that. There are tons of people like that 
who are preying upon you know people and just trying to get their money. And you know, obviously, the most the most notable or the most obvious are those that are on television, like Joel Osteen. You know, people like that. It's so obvious that you'd have to not be churched at all. You'd have to not be you know know anything about the Bible. Obviously, saved people can get sucked into that that know nothing about the Bible. But you would have to not know anything about the Bible or not be saved at all. Because it's so clear, it's so obvious, and you'd also have to be naive, even, even on top of that, to, to you know, not be able to see through Joel Osteen and his pretty white smile. I mean, he, it's, it's so obvious that that guy is just a shyster. You know what Amen. I mean? Right. Just smiles the entire time. Stop smiling at me. Yeah. Now, that's why I don't want to watch Joel Osteen. Not only because of the false doctrine, he's got that fake, it's obvious when he's just fake and phony. I don't know why this popped in my head when I say it. Brother Rick, we were at, um, what was the name of that place in Arizona? It was Barizona? No, it wasn't Barizona. It was out of Africa. And that guy came out with the lions. And I said something about that guy. You remember what I said? He was just, he was just, there was this guy who owned the place. And he was just like super fake and super phony. You can peg people like that immediately. He had like the pretty white smile. That's what made me think of that guy. And he just kept smiling the whole time. He's real fake and he's real phony. And you just get this feeling like, you know, you don't really care about me. You know what I mean? You're, you, everything you're saying right now, like I'm not, I don't, I'm not even interested because I know that you don't really care. You're just fake. You know what I mean? And then when you watch Joel Osteen, it can't, it can't be any more obvious that this guy is just like, you know, Give me all your money. You know what I mean? It's so clear. It's so obvious. And then he gets up, and what does he do? He coincidentally just preaches everything that everybody wants to hear. Yeah. I mean, come on. And the Bible specifically talks about people doing that, you know, preaching messages that will tickle people's ears, right? And then you see people all over doing that all the time. That's what that's speaking of in verse 18. So it says in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, Contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. I, I believe that this is specific to unsaved people, but there are other commands like in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 when a brother or a sister is a railer, a drunkard, an extortioner, it goes through a list of you shouldn't have anything to do with those people. But let's say here, even a saved person, if, if they were to fall into this category, I believe that they still should be marked and avoided. You know, there are doctrines. You know, that, that when, if someone starts teaching and preaching something, especially, now let me say this, and I'll give you a perfect example of this. Especially something, and saved people can do this, something that starts edging on salvation. Something that starts, you know, you know uh, messing with salvation. I'll give you a perfect example of this. Ken Hovind. Ken Hovind, I believe, is clearly saved. I listened to Ken Hovind for many years, you know, and, you know for a very long time. And Ken Hovind, for a super long time in the past, would, you know, would preach repent of your sins sometimes, not repent of your sins sometimes. I will never have fellowship with a guy who preaches repent of your sins, whether I think he's saved or not. Now, that's a perfect example of it. Something especially that has to do with salvation. If there's a church where somebody just clearly preaches something that's confusing from the pulpit, and I'm speaking of salvation, that when they go out soul winning, they, you know, confuse people with the gospel. I have nothing to do with those people. You know, it doesn't mean that if someone fell into that, that I'd say, oh, you're unsaved, you're a reprobate. You know, that's ridiculous. You, can, you, need to be, you need to have discernment on whether or not of someone's salvation. You know, we judge them by the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. If you ask people questions, you tell me, define what you mean by repentance or sins. What are you truly trusting in? You know, you ask them personal questions like that. If somebody starts talking to you about, well, you have to repent of your sins. You have to do this. Well, tell me how you got saved. I just put all my faith in Christ. It's like, then why are you why are you saying repent of your sins then? You know what I mean? Because that'll happen a lot. I've had that happen many times. Many times where I've talked to people, you know, and I'll go soul winning with people at other churches, a couple of churches where I grew up at, and they'll go out and they'll say confusing things like repent of your sins, and you just ask them, like, when you got saved, how, you know, what did you, what, what did you do? So I, go, I was like nine years old and just put my faith in Jesus. It's like... Did you repent of your sins? You know, is it a requirement or is it not a requirement? You know what I mean? If, if someone starts getting into something that has to do with salvation, that's what I believe this verse specifically is talking about. When it says the doctrine which you have received, the doctrine singular, I think it's talking about the faith. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Salvation, right? 
So he says there in verse number 17 in the very beginning, now I beseech you, brethren. So this is, he says beseech. That, that means I'm begging you, like I'm urging you. This is super important, right? I beseech you, brethren. Watch what he says. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. So you say, oh, you shouldn't say people's names like Joel Osteen. Mark them. That's what that means when it says mark them. It means you need to take note of these people. Like to mark them means to like, People need to know who this person is. Mark them so that everybody knows. That's the purpose of this. He wants everyone to know who these people are, so make sure you mark them, and after you mark them, avoid them. Because somebody could say, well, marking them is just staying away from them. No, no, no. Mark them so that you can avoid them. Mark them so that everyone in your church avoids them. Turn over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, I believe it's chapter number 1 at the end of the chapter. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Because people will say things like this all the time. I believe that you should just make it about their doctrine. Don't make it about the person. No, people need to be called out. And we have the example of the apostles doing this constantly. We have the example of particularly Paul doing it constantly. In multiple of his epistles. And what's very interesting about this is he does it you know, in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And I believe that he's doing that to set an example for Timothy who is going to be a pastor. When he's writing to Timothy. So he says in 1 Timothy chapter number uh, 1, look at verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, before on thee. Now watch this. I want to point something out in the context of this. That thou by them mightest, what's he say? War, a good warfare. What does that imply that he's doing? He's fighting. Who is he fighting? He's fighting a battle against the spiritual wickedness of this world. That's, that, you know, it's not just like a spiritual battle like I'm like, like you know, like, uh, like you know, I don't remember who the guy was, but he acted like he was boxing the devil. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Billy I've seen it before. It was Billy Sunday. Yeah. Billy Sunday would act like he's like boxing the devil. He's not talking about like you're literally fighting, you know, like, like a spirit. He's talking about there are wicked spirits, like as in people. He talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. There are wicked people that have control in our government, in our nation. He's talking about, perfect example, someone, this is obviously an extreme example, but the Antichrist. That's spiritual wickedness in high places, and that's a literal person. That is a person, right? Now notice he says that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So he talks to him about fighting, holding faith. And a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And then he says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, I believe that these two particular guys are saved. But you have, by, you know, by you know, what he says right there, he's, uh, you know, but you have, let's avoid that point because I don't want to go too deep, in, deep into that because people argue about that. But you have him naming people, Hymenae, Hymenaeus and Alexander here. Now go over to 2 Timothy. Go over to 2 Timothy. You can see Paul doing this again when he's writing. Look at uh, verse number 17. I almost quoted this, and that's what made me, made me think about where this was in, in chapter number 2 because it's about him warring again. If you look at verse number chapter number 2, verse number 1, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me... Among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Verse 3, watch this. Thou therefore endure so uh, hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So, so we saw prior when he named the names, when he mentioned people, right? He talked about warring. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, he's telling him, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number seven. Excuse me, 17. Look at verse 16 first. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. And then he says, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So you have you know, an example in two different epistles where he mentions people, where he names their names. And he does that, I believe, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 again, where he talks about Alexander. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, does anybody know the exact verse of that? Verse number 14, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his work. So notice he drops the names of people. And he's not wishing for something good on this person. He says, he did bad to me. 
He did something evil to me, the Lord reward him according to his works. What's he saying? He wants God to give him blessings? That's not what he's saying. He's saying he did bad things to me, let God repay him with what he deserves, right? So you see a, a clear example of Paul, public letters that have been read by millions of Christians, and what's he doing? Dropping people's names. So it's not biblical to say, oh, you shouldn't mention, mention people's names. That's not biblical. That, is, that has come from this ultra-sensitive society that we, that we live in where everybody walks on eggshells and tries not you know, to offend anybody. That's not biblical. That attitude is not biblical. Right. You know, people, you know, even, even, you know, not where I work, because I work on a construction site very often, but, it, you know, I, you know, if you work in like an office, in like an office setting, I can imagine how weird it's gotten nowadays. You know what I mean, Brother Hall? Has it? You can't really tell. Right, right, you didn't talk about it, right. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. But, it's, you know, I, I, you always hear about how there's all these rules and regulations. And, like, if you say anything to anybody, if you do anything to anybody, you're just, like, going to get fired and lose your job. It's because the world is, like, so sensitive. You know, people are just way, you know, they're just overly sensitive. Like, you, people can't take criticism, can't take construction criticism. Everybody gets a reward. It's all, you know, everybody gets a trophy. When they're playing in sports, that is so ridiculous. You're not helping these kids, you know what I mean? And it's just this ultra-sensitive society where, where we should just never tell anyone they're wrong. We should just never correct anyone. And that's where this, like, creeps into Christianity where, you know, you shouldn't be, like, publicly calling, you know, uh, all these pastors out. You shouldn't be publicly calling all of these people out. That's not biblical. If you want to add that stupid philosophy outside of the church, do whatever you want to do, but that's not biblical. That's not what the Bible teaches. If somebody does something wrong, if there's someone, especially, you know, let's say that there's a pastor that is a man of God and he, you know, is going wayward, he turns and he's like making bad decisions and it's decisions and he's harming people, you should mark that man and avoid him and he should be called out. Just like Hymenaeus and Philetus, just like Hymenaeus. And, and then you have Alexander mentioned at the end. All of these people that you see him calling out. That's not the only, there's other examples as well where Paul calls people out. People need to be noted. People need to be marked down, spoken of, called out by, behind the pulpit sometime, mentioned so that people know, stay away from this guy. Amen. You know, he's heading down a bad path. Stay away from this guy. Stay away from this person, whoever it may be. Go back to Romans chapter number 16 there again. We'll, we'll pick back up in verse number 19. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So that's a good uh, commendation right there. You know, he gives them a good accolade, if you will, in verse number 19. He says, for your obedience has come abroad unto all men. So people are talking about like, hey, man, the Romans, they're obedient. The Romans, those guys, they, you know, those, those, that is an obedient bunch. They follow God's laws. You know, you come there and, you know, you want to teach them something, they'll listen to you. They'll, you know, they'll take this and they'll add this to their, to their spiritual, you know, uh, repertoire. They'll, they'll, they'll use this. There's things that they'll keep. They're an obedient bunch. And it says, it's come abroad unto all men. I mean, they must have, they must have had to have been a very obedient group that people are talking about this. All men, all, all the other uh, churches of the Gentiles, I'm sure, is what he's referring to. And then he says, I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But then he gives them a warning. But yet, I would have you wise unto that which is good. And then he says, and simple concerning evil, which is very good advice. You know, you don't need to, you don't need to know how, you know, uh, let me think of an example, like how the mafia runs. You know, you don't need to know how, you know, to run a whorehouse. I'm just giving extreme examples, right? You don't need to know how all that works. You don't need to know the works of darkness. You don't need to know how, you know, all, all you know, how the, the, you know, an evil person operates in their life. You don't need to know about all that stuff. You know, people talk about we need to educate ourselves you know about this kind of... No, you don't. You need to be simple concerning evil. Perfect example is Job. Think about Job. It says he was, he was an upright man. What did he do? He eschewed evil. He, you can't learn it if you stay away from it, right? That's he's saying he's, a, he's eschewing it. Like, it's not around him. So you're not going to be able to learn about your simple concerning evil. 
Right? If somebody tries to talk to you about something bad at work, somebody, one of your friends tries to bring something up to you or a family member that you're speaking to on the phone, something that's evil, say, hey, man, I don't want to know anything about that. You keep that to yourself. You want to know about that? You know, that what you do what you want to do, but I don't want to know anything about that. Be simple concerning evil. You know, you don't need to, you know, no dirty jokes. You know, if people are, you know, talking dirty jokes around me, you know, at work or something, or they try to tell me one, I always ask somebody if they tell me to. You know, if they're gonna get ready to tell me a joke, I'll ask them immediately, like, is this a dirty joke? I don't wanna hear it if it is. Seriously. Because I wanna be simple concerning evil. I don't want that junk in my mind and then not going away. Right. You know what I mean? So don't tell me, you know, I don't wanna hear your dirty jokes. Amen. You know, you you know, I don't wanna do I don't have nothing to do with it. Be simple concerning evil. Invest your time and be wise in that which is good. Look at verse number twenty. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now, this is a very interesting statement. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 3. I know we compared this, um, if you remember, in a sermon that I preached about our inheritance in Christ. Because this is a specific promise that is never mentioned about a believer specifically inherited. But once you understand the doctrine that we inherit all things through Christ, it makes perfect sense. Once you understand that we inherit all things as a son of God, because Christ is the son of God and we are in Christ... It makes perfect sense. All things, that all the glory that God gives in the Christ, you know, we receive that glory. That's why he did that was for us. That's the whole purpose of that. This is actually spoken of the Messiah doing this. Look in Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 15, we'll, we'll begin reading. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise thy his heel. Now this is God speaking unto the serpent because the serpent had beguiled Eve. And we know that that serpent was Satan. It was the devil. And he tells him after he speaks of the woman, the woman, see he says right there, and I will put enmity. That's like the feeling of being an enemy. It's like animosity uh, somewhat. So he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And he says, and between thy seed so it's like speaking of like a child of Satan, which I believe is referring to and like an allusion to the Antichrist. Thy seed, and then he says this, between thy seed and her seed, which would be Jesus Christ, right? Between thy seed and her seed, and, it said, and then he says, it shall bruise thy head. Talking about that seed, talking about the Messiah, right? Talking about the Christ is going to bruise the serpent's head. And then he says, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Because why? Because he's going to step on Satan. He's going to, you know, uh, destroy Satan in that way. You flip back to verse number 20 in Re uh, Ro <clears throat> excuse me, Romans 16. He says, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So it's only time this is mentioned we see Genesis chapter number 3, a promise given that the Messiah will one day destroy Satan. But then we see it when it's quoted in Romans 16. It's interesting because he says directed to or addressing the Christian, the, the, uh, those at Rome. And he says, he's going to be bruised under your feet. Because we come with Christ. We inherit all things through Christ. Everything Christ does, those things are given to us. Amen. Keep Amen. reading there. And uh, the end there he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Verse number 21. Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason... And Sosipater, my kinsman, salute you. Now, Timothy is mentioned first in Acts chapter number 16. We're not going to look at him because Timothy is talked about a lot. Timothy was the son of, uh, of a uh, Jewish woman who believed. And then uh, his, um, his father was a Greek, the Bible teaches. And Paul actually meets him for the first time in Acts chapter number 16. He obviously goes on um, to be a pastor. He's written, you know, the pastoral epistles are written to Timothy and to Titus, those three letters. And two of the epistles are written to Timothy himself, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And you can see in a lot of Paul's epistles that Timothy is there with Paul. Very often in the beginning of an epistle, Paul will say, you know, uh, Timothy is with him in the very beginning in the introduction of the epistle. So you see there uh, Timothy being mentioned. Uh, Jason is also mentioned. A Jason is mentioned in the book of Acts. And I believe it's Acts chapter number 17. I'm not positive, but in the book of Acts, Jason is mentioned. 
So you can maybe study that out and see if that's the same person. Verse number 22, it says, I, Tertius, or Tertius, I believe, is how uh, Alexander Scorby pronounces that. But I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Now, this is interesting because you read through the entire epistle, and especially if maybe if this was your first time reading the Bible, it starts off like Paul is addressing them. And then it gets to verse number 22, and it's like, I, Tertius, who wrote this uh, epistle. An epistle is a letter. It's a formal letter, though. So it's a letter, but it's a formal, more of a formal letter. That's what an epistle is. So he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you. And he says, in the Lord. So we can see that Tertius is actually the one that put the pen to the page. He's the one that's writing down all these words. And you see Paul speaking them. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter number 36. This is a very common process that is used when Scripture is pinned down. We can see this talked about, you know, uh, you refer to it as the, the method that God use, uses for the inspiration of Scripture. Look at Jeremiah 36, um, begin reading in verse 14. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushai, unto Barak, saying... Take in thine hand the roll. Now that is the scripture that Jeremiah had, had thus far written down of the book of Jeremiah. The roll wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people. So he's reading down, he was reading to them the book of Jeremiah. The, the, uh, and these were specific, um, you know, they were curses that were going to be coming upon them and warnings that they were reading to them. Uh, in the ears of the people and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand. And we would refer to that as a scroll each time when we read roll there took the, the roll in his hand and came unto them and said unto them, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Barak read it in their ears. Now it came to pass when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and another, and said unto Barak, We will surely tell the king of all these words. Verse 17, And they asked Barak, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Now, right off the bat when I read that, I always think that's an interesting question that he asks. It kind of just seems like an odd question, like, how did you write all these words in his mouth? They're asking, like, how did this actually work out? So they already know that he wrote them down, and Jeremiah spoke them. Now, think about this. Does it seem like it takes a rocket science to figure out how this took place? The reason why I think that they mention that is because they're like, these are not normal words. How did this get on paper? You know what I'm saying? They hear these words, and they're scared. You know why? Because they know this is really the words of God. These curses that are being that are that he's uh, you know uh, you know putting upon us and proclaiming that we deserve, he's like you know how did you write these in his mouth? Like what is this? Because it's not normal words. It's the words of God. And you see all the time when Jesus shows up and he's preaching, how do people act? They're like, no man spake like this man. There's something different about this guy. There's something different about his words. So they understood. Hey. Jeremiah spoke the words and he wrote them down. I mean, what else is there to explain? And that's what's interesting is, look, he just explains exactly what they ask. Look at how simple his answer is. It's, it's, it's almost, uh, it seems uh, you know, like a joke, if you will. Verse 18, then Barak answered them, he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth. It's like, doesn't that seem simple? Like, why is he saying this? It's like, why are you asking that? You know why I believe they're asking that is because they're like, how did, how did this process work? How did you get this message from God? That's what they're asking. How did this get down on paper? And he just says, he gives them very specific, you know, he pronounced them and I wrote them down. You know, it's exactly what you just asked me. He pronounced the word, all these words with his mouth and it says, and I wrote them with ink in the book. So he's like, he's like overly specific about how this took place. But you know why it's very interesting that we, I'm glad we have that because you know what you see? You see a very clear explanation of the process or the method of inspiration. You see one person speaking the words, Paul. And then what happens? Tertius or Tertius sits down and he writes them down with ink and a book. Paul pronounces the words. He speaks the words. The Bible says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So you have the Holy Spirit coming upon a man and God speaks his word through a man. He uses a holy man and he speaks his words through him and then they are written down with ink in a book. It's very interesting how that's worded. He pronounced them and I wrote them down. Go back to uh, Romans chapter number 16, verse number 22. So that explains that. And what's that? That is referred to as, and, uh, this is also another, 
A synonym for this is a secretary, but an, uh, it's, it's called an amanuensis. Amanuensis. That is someone that writes down something that someone else is speaking. You know, man is referring to the person writing it down. And you instance is, it means that it's, it's words. It's, it actually comes from like secretary, that you're doing it something on behalf of someone else. It comes from a Greek word that means secretary. So it's saying that, they, that you are doing something for someone else, right? And the man refers to writing it down. It's called a man you instance. And that's what Tertius is here. That's what Baruch was. He was Jeremiah's a man you instance, or his secretary. He probably would like that, I'm sure, in heaven. It's like, don't call me that. Look at verse number 23. Gaius, my host, and of the whole church, saluted you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluted you, and Cordus, a brother. So these are the people that are with them now. So they concluded like saluting them. So if you want to look and break this down, actually what you see is, like I mentioned last week, the body of the letter, the purpose of why he wrote to them, the message that he wanted to deliver to them, ended in Romans chapter number 15, verse number 33. He begins in Romans chapter number 16, giving them salutations. He goes all the way down through there to verse number 18, and he has something specific that he wants to mention to them. He gives them a blessing and, and concludes, look at the end of verse number 20, you see another amen. And then he talks about verse number 21 and down on through there, people that are with him. Now, now I have a few other people that want to salute you also. Now these people, kind of, so there is, there is, a, there is a, you know, a method to this. This isn't just all over the place. You understand what I'm saying? They, when they wrote this, this letter down, there are portions. That's why it's an epistle. That's why I'm explaining this right now. Everyone understand that this is a formal letter. So the, this thing, you can break down where the, uh, the introduction is. The greeting in the beginning, you can see where the body of the letter picks up. You can see where the body of the letter ends or closes. You can see where the salutations begin. You can see where the salutations of whom Paul, whom Paul is saluting, ends or concludes. Then after that, you can see that there are people with Paul that want to also salute them. He allows them to salute them, including Tertius who salutes them. And then he gives them a, 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 another amen in verse number 24. So the other people that are writing them, that concludes as well. So the other people that want to salute them, like Cordus, that's the only name with a Q in the entire Bible right there. Cordus, a brother, it says. And then verse number 24, look what it says. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So you see another finality. So all those people are done saluting them. Right? You see how this is very structured? Does everyone see that this is clearly, you know, very structured? That's why it's an epistle. That's what an epistle is. It's very formal. So you see in verse number 25, he gives them the very last blessing or the very last, you know, um, uh, you know uh, blessing would be the correct word there. The very last blessing that he gives them in verse number 25, he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now I want to cross-reference a couple of verses and we'll be finished here. This idea that he's speaking of the gospel was secret in the past, but now was made manifest. Speaking of the method of salvation, of how this was revealed, actually the specific details of how this took place. They in the Old Testament, they were saved by faith, and they knew that they were saved by the Messiah. They knew that God was going to save them, but they didn't understand the details, even to the point where the disciples, when Jesus is explaining to them how he's going to save them, that he's going to die, they're confused. And they're like, it's not going to happen. You know, even to the point where Peter, like, corrects the Lord, and then the Lord has to rebuke him, right? So this was a secret. This was never really clearly revealed in the Old Testament, right? But you see this idea spoken of a couple of times, and I want to show that to you, that, that Paul mentions this. Go over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Uh, I want to compare a couple of things. You'll see similar statements. Once you see all three of these in a row, it'll make sense. He says in Paul... In, uh, Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So right there he says that Jesus Christ is our hope, and then compare that to 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, compare that also to Titus chapter number 1. You can see all of this language is, is kind of all put together, all in one statement. 
Look at Titus chapter number 1. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope. So we saw hope mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised. We saw promise mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter number 1. So you can see these parallels. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now look at verse 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of our God, uh, of God our Savior. Now notice a lot, uh, especially Titus chapter number 1, verses 1 through 3 there is a strong parallel with Romans chapter number 16 especially. I want to show you the consistency on how these are very similar in each one of the pastoral epistles, the greeting that he gives to them. But if you compare Romans 16 verses 25 through 26, how there's a lot of things that are mentioned, how he speaks of this being a mystery. He speaks of this being promised before the world began. He speaks how this is a commandment of God our Savior and how he talks about it being preached. He talks about the preaching. And when you look at uh, verse number 26 or verse number 25, he talks about and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So it's a very strong parallel, especially Titus 1, 1 through 3 with Romans 16, 25 through 26. And he says, now to him, verse 25, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Now he's just restating the same thing. The gospel or the preaching of Jesus Christ is what has now been revealed. It used to be a mystery. He's just restating the same thing. The gospel has now been revealed and it used to be a mystery. It was, it was not understood. It says it was a mystery. It was kept secret since the world began. Now this goes back to what we talked about in John chapter number 17. Notice it was kept secret since the world began. But it had to have existed. You can't keep something secret that didn't exist. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? That plan was already in order. The word, the promise had literally already came out of God's mouth. And whatever comes out of God's mouth, it fulfills. Amen. You know, and then you see when Jesus Christ is born of the virgin, you see the word being made flesh. You can see that promise that was with God that he had already promised already before the world began. We can see that take place in, you know, Luke chapter number one, verse number 35, for example. Amen. That was kept secret since the world began. But look now. But now is made manifest, right? That was, it was made manifest. And what are we talking about? I want you to think about this. We're talking about the gospel. And how was it made manifest? Because the word was made manifest. Think about that. That's what made it manifest. He was that promise that was kept secret. And he was, God was manifest in the flesh. So the promise, the word, simultaneously, the word was with God and the word was God. Both are true. That's a literal meaning. God made that promise, the spoken words, and those words that he spoke prior, they became flesh. Amen. That happened. His literal words became flesh. But guess what? That's why he says, the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You know, it's interesting when you go back to Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, God is speaking, Jehovah is speaking, and he says, my glory will I not give to another. Amen. Think about that for a minute. My glory, I, he's saying, I'm not going to share that with another guy. Somebody who's not me. Then you have God manifest in the flesh. You have him praying to God. And he says, the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Amen. What's he saying? He's saying, we, and you can say, oh, there's a plurality there. Yeah, because you have God in heaven and then you have God manifest in the flesh. Same God, same purpose. A person. Raised the mystery of godliness. And they had this uh, uh, you know, glory together because the one true God in heaven, he promised that he was going to come down and do that. And now you have the man who has taken on a new identity, the man who has been, has been made flesh, who's conscious, he's thinking, he's learning, he's growing, and the hour has come, he says. Now watch what he says. He says, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify thee. But God says in the Old Testament, I'm not going to give my glory to another. You're left with one option. The same guy that said I'm not giving my glory to another is the same guy that's on earth, you know, receiving the glory. Right. Therefore, the Son must be the Father. Case closed. He's not giving his glory to anybody else. Amen. It's that simple, man. There's no way out of that. I mean, it's super easy. And you have that man praying to 
himself. There's nothing wrong with that. Praying to the one and only true God. You know, obviously you have to understand that this is a real prayer. This is not like virtual reality or a joke or a game. He's really, in the, he's praying the same way that we pray. He's really a man. He's really, you know, limited, if you will, right? He's praying to the one and only true God, but he knows. Obviously, God, the man, knows that that is himself in heaven. He knows the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He's bringing himself glory. He's bringing salvation unto himself. That's what's going on. And this mystery was kept secret since the world began. This promise, but then God was manifest in the flesh. The word was made flesh. That promise was made flesh, and then it was all clear, it was all seen. And then he comes, and what does he do? He says that he's manifest. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the man that which thou gavest me. He says, I've manifested thy name. Why did he manifest his name? Because salvation has to be through the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? It has to be through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does John 17, chapter number 3 says? It, it teaches that... I just went blank. What does it say? Somebody give me the first word. Does anybody remember it? John 17, 3? Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> then this is life eternal. This, and this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God. And then he says, in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So notice he says, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's interesting because Jesus Christ speaks in third person. Isn't that interesting? You know how you know the only true God? I have manifested thy name. You know, you know the only true God, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. So they have to know Jesus Christ. And he says, I have manifested thy name. How do they think about this? That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent? If, what did the Father, you know, how did the Father reveal himself? What did they learn about if the Father's a first person in heaven that never came down, that never said anything, that never spoke to anybody, what more did they learn about him? Think about that. If he's a first person who has his own personality, he has, he's just, you know, he's totally distinct. How would they have obtained salvation? What did they learn about him? How did they get to know him? Think about that for a minute. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? They had no new revelation, according to these people, of the Father. But he says that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And then he says, I have manifested thy name. You know how you get to know the, the, you know, the one and only true God? By knowing the one and only true God in the flesh. Amen. And he manifested his name, which is Jesus Christ. Right. And God says, I'm not going to share my glory with another. Right. So therefore, when he says, glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. That's the same Lord speaking in the Old Testament saying... I'm not sharing my glory with another. Therefore, the guy that said that is the guy that's living on the earth. Right. And that's praying. Amen. I mean, that's super clear. Amen. Verse number 26, it says, But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God. And it says, Made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now, I, this is super important. You need to you know, keep this in mind when I'm getting ready to show you right now. The very last verse, I'm going to read it real quick to you, and then we're going to conclude. But people often say, you know, salvation is by obeying God. Salvation is by obedience, right? And when they say obedience, they are referring to being obedient to the commandments. They are referring to being obedient to the law or the works of the flesh, right? They're not, they do not believe the true gospel that teaches that we are saved by faith alone. One of the uh, passages that they will turn you to is um, Hebrews 5.9. I thought it was 10, but 5.9 says, And being made perfect, he, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So people will turn to that passage and say, See, you just have to obey Jesus. You gotta be baptized. You gotta keep the commandments. You gotta, and then they just privately interpret that. Say you just have to obey everything. But first of all, let's let's say this. It's speaking of Jesus Christ when it talks about how he's the captain of our salvation, right? What did Jesus preach in order for people to be saved? Yeah, believe the gospel. So let's just look first at the example of what Jesus said. Number one, let's look at what he said you had to believe to be saved. And what does he say? Repent ye and believe the gospel. You know, and obviously I'm not going to go over what repent means, and, you know, at the same time here. But repentance is just the change of mind. That's all that repent means. God repents more than anybody else in the Bible. You know, disproving the idea that the word repent alone means 
to turn from sin because we know that God does not have sin. Therefore, repent does not mean to turn from sin. It means to change your mind. Amen. So when he says, repent and believe the gospel, he's speaking to people that don't believe the gospel. He's saying, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel, right? So what do we have to obey? We have to obey the gospel. And Romans chapter number 16, verse number 26, is a perfect example of what you have to do. It's a perfect example of what you have to obey. And what does it say there at the end? Made, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So let's interpret Hebrews 5, 9 in light of Romans chapter number 16, verse 26. And what do you have to obey? You have to obey the gospel by what? Faith. By believing. So if somebody tries to pin you down, tries to show you maybe when you're out soul winning or whatever it may be, look at Hebrews 5, 9. And they use some other passage like, hey, you've got to obey God to be saved. Where the Bible talks about obedience for salvation? Yeah. You have to obey the gospel. And what is the command? Believe. So there is obedience that needs to take place, but that does not, you know, ergo, you must keep the law. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's see what we have to obey. What's the command first, right? You can't just pick and choose the command. There's a specific command for salvation, right? Amen. And that is to believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. It's the obedience of faith that saves. Conclude our Romans uh, uh, series here. Verse number 27, it says, To God only wise. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Notice what that said. You see him as the mediator. What does it say? To God only wise. It says be glory. Am I, am I quoting that correctly? Be glory through Jesus Christ. Notice that. Remember what it says in Philippians chapter number 2. That every knee is going to bow to Jesus Christ. To the glory of God the Father. So we praise God through the mediator. Because he came down and he's known, he's made himself manifest yeah. through the man Christ Jesus. And he receives, he's, he's ordained that he receives all of that glory through the man Christ Jesus. So how do we praise God? We praise him through Jesus. Yeah. So when you pray to the one and only true God, there's only one God up there. There's only one person up there. You pray in his name that he was given on this earth as a man. He ordained that that is his glory. The hour has come, he said, glorify thy son. That was the glory. That is the glory for all eternity that he will be given through the man Christ Jesus and the great works that he did on this earth. Through Jesus Christ, we praise the one and only true God because Jesus Christ is the one and only true God. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for all the, uh, all the amazing things that we can learn even from a, a chapter that is just... Uh, Large portions of it are just meant for salutations, dear Lord. God, we ask you that, that we would just love your word. We'd study it. Uh, we ask you to open our eyes to it, to where we can just learn more, and uh, we can love it more, and, and, and uh, thereby uh, love you more. We ask you to be with us and keep us safe and help our church to, uh, to grow and to just thrive and to be a blessing to other people and get many people saved. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.